Hi, everybody. I'm Audrey Moore with the Audrey Helps Actors Podcast, and this is episode number 103. What's it gonna be for your acting career as you wrap up self-tape May 2023? This episode is called Being a Working Actor. Today we have the one, the only, the legend, the magnificent Elisa Perry. Elisa is a longtime friend and working actress. You might know her from, I'm going to just roll through this, a little show called Godless, which I may be familiar with, How to Get Away with Murder, Bull, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Grey's Anatomy, Southland, Weeds, Hung, Dexter, Everybody Hates Chris, Lincoln Heights, The Shield, Strong Medicine. She's done so many movies, Ad Astra, Ready Player One, Roman J. Esquire. She's done commercials. She's done tons of theater. She's done all of it. She has worked her butt off and she's been doing it for a minute. So I am so grateful to her for coming on the podcast. We're going to talk about what a working actor's life is really like, what the last strike did to an actor's life and what it might do to this one. We also talk about how to shut out all the outside chatter. Honestly, this is one of my favorite conversations. Who's filling your head with shit? And which things are real? What is what is real? What is a lot of noise? What's helpful? Who's qualified? All right, self-tape May, 16 tapes, one month. Can you do it? I hope so. When this episode releases, you will have three more days to get your tapes in. I love it when people are like, F it, three days, let's go. And they do like 16 tapes in three days. That gives me life. This tally closes on midnight on May 31st on Hawaii's local time zone because aloha, ladies and gentlemen, Hawaii, take me, please. Talking to you, NCIS Hawaii. Call me. Hire me. Por favor. And everyone that finishes 16 tapes by that time will be entered to win the random drawing for our biggest prize yet. One lucky winner will get a year of castability, a session with self-tapes here, a casting network's premium annual membership, a a two-and-a-half-hour headshot session with Bella Seville Photography, Free admission to Erica Bream and Kara Shoot Rosenbaum's class, Ace Your Self Tape, colon, co stars. Free admission to Amy Linden's Saturday intensive class, and so much more! Go to selftapemay.com to register for free to be entered in the prize package. Go double check and make sure your Instagram name is registered at the site and you're up on the progress board. Do that before the deadline. Do it. Selftapemay.com. That's selftapemay.com. Strike update. SAG AFTRA strike authorization. I need you to log in. I need you to go and put in your little SAG number, the last four of your social security, and it's going to give you a pin. You also got mailed a pin to you via postcard. However, you get your pin, you got to have your pin. And then you go in and it's just one simple question. You vote yes, yes, to authorize a strike. That does not mean that we are striking. That does not mean a strike has begun. It means that you yourself are giving a yes, a yes, a cheers, a check mark, thumbs up to the committee that is going to negotiate for us. So that if the AMPTP, which is the producers, if they come and they are not negotiating a deal in good faith with our union, then our union leaders who've been elected by us and have been working on the negotiating contract forever. If you don't know that, go back and listen to my episode with Liz Ho. It's a long, lengthy process, tons of membership involvement, voices being heard, very well thought out. The AMPTP is not gonna negotiate with us in good faith then the SAG strike authorization vote allows our union leaders the ability to then call a strike. And I want you to know, we are in a very good negotiating position with the strike authorization in tow. And 
We are in a very good negotiating position in general right now. I am very hopeful about the leverage that it gives us. The more people that vote and the more of those people that vote that vote yes, the more solidarity we are showing up to the negotiation table with the stronger that makes us look. Because if only like 12 people vote yes, then what happens is they can call a strike authorization and they will believe that then the the union's not going to be in solidarity with itself to get done whatever needs to get done. So what you want is a strong, high percentage yes. You want as many people voting and we want all those people that vote all to say yes. That gives us the most leverage going in. Now, if you have friends that are like kind of semi-retired, if they're like, man, I don't really act so much anymore, but they are still union members, this is what I did. I highly encourage you to just text them and say, hey, I know you've been a little inactive. This is happening, and it would really mean a lot to me if you went and put in your number and you voted. I've had friends do that. They have done that gratefully and graciously. It's everybody. Everybody needs to vote. So go do it. This week's podcast is brought to you by Castability. Get real feedback on your self-tapes from real casting professionals. Also by Carla Zuniga Hair. Carla's back. She's in Los Angeles. Both Jesse and I get our haircuts from Carla at Carla Zuniga Hair on Instagram. Also, voice lessons by Greg Sathel at singinglessonslosangeles.com. Your voice helps define your casting. It's important. All right. I hope you're setting up your final self-tape for Self-Tape May 2023, episode 103. What's it going to be this week? How many are you going to do? Are you going to do more than 16? Why not? And if it's a real audition, I hope you mute it on Instagram. And I hope that you... Book it! Audrey helps actors because they don't know anything. Hi, everybody. I'm Audrey Moore with the Audrey Helps Actors podcast. And today we have one of my favorite people in the whole wide world. Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Elisa Perry, Audrey's favorite person. (laughs) Yay! Elisa, we did it. We got you on. I know. I, I feel really honored. I made the list. <laughs> of course you made the list. You've been on the list for a long time, to be fair. We we just finally made it happen, and I'm so thrilled. And you and I did Godless together moons ago, and we were fortunate enough to be able to do a lot of the publicity in the show, and we have both since then had more upswings and downswings in each of our careers. <laughs> And I really wanted to have someone on another perspective that could talk about the realities of being a working actor and how that affects our lives. In addition to, we are going into probably at least one strike this summer. I know that you were around in the acting community like I was for the last writer's strike. And I would love any information that you want to do and chat about that. And then you also said that you wanted to talk about everybody listening to outside chatter. And I'm guessing tell them to stop it. Stop listening to that chatter. (laughs) So tell everyone a little bit about yourself. I always start by talking about are you union? Do you audition? What do you do? Voiceover, commercial, theater, film, television? How many times in a week might you audition? All those sorts of things. Okay, I am union. I have been in the union since, oh God, 1997. Whoop, whoop. I am in all of the unions, SAG after, before it was SAG after, all of that good stuff. Mm-hmm. I do whoever's hiring television, film commercials i haven't been able to break over break out into voiceovers would love to do that too so Mm -hmm. tell everybody about your audition landscape now as you sit here today what does a typical week or month look like are you auditioning commercially and theatrically television film and theater like how many times are you would you say you're getting an audition per month per week what does that look like Let me start by saying that I started out averaging about two auditions a month. Mm. 
years ago. Mm. Years ago, like when I first came to LA, it was like maybe two auditions a month if I was lucky. Mm -hmm. And over the years, you know, it's grown as your career grows, your representation grows. So now I average probably about theatrically, honestly, I probably average anywhere from two to three auditions a week. Commercially lately, it's been maybe one audition or two a week, maybe. Mm. One of the things I always like to talk to actors about is the diversification in a career, that this idea of it being normal or standard even that actors just work in one medium is, I think, particularly old fashioned. If it ever existed, honestly, I don't know if it even ever existed, but it certainly, I think, is is an outdated uh perspective now. Do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, it's definitely changed. And I'm also, I'm an old Hollywood movie buff. Like the, even this is the history of actors. Mm. And so I look at the careers of actors from the 1950s, 60s, you know, in the 50s and 60s, theater was it. Like that legitimized you as an actor. Mm. And if you went from theater to movies, you were kind of looked down upon. And then it changed, you know, silent movies went away. Speaking parts, you got deals with studios. So then it went from, oh, if you did movies, oh, you don't do television. Mm -mm. And then streaming services happen. And so now everyone's doing commercials mm -hmm. from A-listers. Mm -hmm. I don't care, you're a spokesperson. You might be the voice of it. At the end of the day, it's a commercial. So I feel like at this point in entertainment, every single thing has shifted. I think everyone's pretty much at a place where wherever I get the job, makes pays me the money, I'll do it. I don't have to sell my firstborn to go taking a chance on it. I don't have to get rid of my dog. Yeah. But if it works for me... I will do it. And so, you know, I have a friend actually who's a set designer for an Israeli advertising company. Mm. And some of the names that he works with in commercials that only will air in Europe, you know, I think it's just all one. And I, I to be honest, when I meet, you know, young actors and they say, well, I'm just a comedic actor. Mm. That might be where you're most comfortable. But the reality of it is the business may shift where you actually end up. Mm -hmm. You just ha you just have to be willing to be open to it. Now, you and I have both had, I think, swings in our life where we'll have this time where we're working a lot commercially and then this time mm -hmm. where we're only booking comedies and no one will see you for a drama. And then you have this time where you're only booking dramas and no one will see you for a comedy. Like these sort of swings that seem to happen unbeknownst to you as though people forget yeah. that you've done all of that what's been your experience with that um yeah it's definitely been it's definitely been a shift and what i've learned in the past few years probably since we did godless especially because mm. when we did godless you know we had like 13 emmy nominations we were at the emmys the, we were at these award shows and it was a wonderful time we're doing press for it and so i think as an actor you think that you think that job is going to be the next job to get you the blah 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 mm -hmm. soon after that i had a great trajectory like i went from godless to a movie coming out with Brad Pitt, Denzel Washington, Viola, Jeff Daniels, Colin Farrell, like all these m amazing people to crickets. Mm -hmm. Crickets in the sense of there wasn't like I had all these other jobs lined up. It was still back to the same grind. Mm -hmm. And then COVID happened. And then the, then the crickets went to sleep. You know, we're in a business where, and I was listening to your podcast with Michael Lee, the, the, mm -hmm. last week. Michael, who you introduced me to. So thank you so much for that, for connecting us. Thank you. He's amazing. But he has such a great perspective on the process of being an actor. 80% of our job is auditioning. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. You know, I had a, a a friend of mine, I remember her telling me her acting teacher told her when they finished the program, okay, congratulations, you guys are now officially professional auditioners. So at some point as an actor, you have to embrace that journey. And I find and make it really enjoyable and productive for yourself and not put so much weight on getting the job as opposed to, like Michael says, wow, today I get to play an attorney. I, for three minutes, I get to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? For mm -hmm. five minutes, I get to be a mom, whatever. And just enjoy the journey and know that, you know, eventually you will work. Will you work all the time? Who knows? You might, I don't know. You know, being an actor is almost like having a dog. What you do for that puppy at eight weeks, you'll be doing the same thing for that dog at 10 years old. So with being an actor, what you do auditioning now, you may still be auditioning at 65, 70 years old. I don't care what you've done in the past. Every, and everybody's career won't go up. We mm -hmm. all won't reach the top. Mm -hmm. And even those who do go back down almost always, really. Always. 
Always. Right? They're shocked. Like I'm like I was on Twitter recently and there's this actress on there who was complaining about the whole you know, the whole self tape situation, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And she's saying, you know, I'm paying to go get self tape. And this is someone who I know of in television works all the time. And I'm like, wow, she's having to go through the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's part of it. One of the things that you and I talk about a lot, which I just really love this perspective. I don't think it can be faked. I think it has to be earned. Is this idea that you always bring up and remind me of that there's going to be another audition coming. Mm -hmm. Just remembering there's another one and another one and another one. This isn't your last audition. This isn't your last. It's not likely your last job. It's just you don't know how long till the next audition comes. But allowing that information and really to a certain point it becomes a fact i mean once you've established yourself in the industry once people know who you are once you have a reputation for doing consistent good work that maybe sometimes doesn't hit the mark but they know that generally speaking you're doing fantastic work you're going to get more auditions because one of the things you're talking about to me is about how you keep a good attitude how you allow auditions to be fun and exciting and interesting and engaging, especially now in the self-tape era. And I think that there is a lot of rightful frustration and heartache and people feeling perturbed by the entire process. So what are your thoughts on all of that? Let me just start with auditions. Mm -hmm. I would rather have three auditions a month and book at least one of those jobs, Mm. then 30 auditions a month and come up empty handed. The bottom line, you know, you know what I mean? It's like, it's because, you know, like with commercials, you hear like, oh, it's a numbers game. It's a numbers game. Theatrically, you know, it's not a numbers game. It's, Mm -hmm. it really isn't. But I say the whole process of where we are with auditioning, let's be honest, we were already in self-tape mode before COVID. What COVID did was just push us all the way into that process of auditioning. I remember there's one casting director. I would go in for her, but it was always by way of self-tape. Hmm. Hmm. And I'm like, I don't understand. Her office is 10 minutes from my house. Why can't I just go down there and just see see, see them in person? Yeah. And then, And I was like, I know she sees people in person because, you know, I know someone who went in. Hmm. And so I was like, I don't understand. Why can't I be seen in person? I'd like to see how she looks for a change. And so then I talked to my agent. They were like, well, that's pretty much how she does it. She sees everybody by way of self-tape until you get to whatever, the next step, producers Mm -hmm. or whatever. Then cut to literally two weeks later, I got an audition from this casting director and it was in person. Mm -hmm. And I got there and it was just me. So I'm like, oh, I probably, I know I'm, I'm a contender for this. Wow. And it was this limited series project. I was like... You know, I was like, oh, my God, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get this. Well, no, (laughs) Uza Dubo got that job and it was probably always her job. Mm -hmm, But mm -hmm. guess what? For that time that I had to prepare for that audition, to me, it was a win because I got to spend time being Shirley Chisholm for Mm -hmm, two days. mm -hmm. And then I got to finally go in the office and meet this casting director. So I just looked at it as guess what? Whatever I did, she felt like, let me finally see her in person. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that we have to learn to do as actors is, one, have some degree of grace, appreciation, and look for when there's always a win in Mm. something. You know, I was in New York in November for a whole month because I had like four callbacks, in-person callbacks for a play Mm. for the same exact role. Four different productions of the <laughs> same play, the same exact. So you go and thinking, I, I'm going to book one of these. This, right. this, is, this is crazy. I'm going to book one of these. I didn't book one. I came up empty handed. Hmm. However, one of the casting offices that I got in front of, I had never, she had never seen me before ever. They reached out to my agents and said, we loved her. She was compelling. Blah, 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 blah. Since then, that casting director has brought me in twice off of requesting me, hmm. specifically requesting me. So to me, I didn't get that. But to me, guess what? It was a bigger win. Like I always tell people, it's like, it's a cultivation of a relationship. So, and that includes, be careful who you pass on. Mm. Because if you're passing on a casting office that you've never been in before, it's probably not a good idea. And like, you know, I always say, auditions are like buses. You miss one, there's always another one coming. That's for sure. If if you expect the number 34 bus to come at 2 p.m. every day, and today it's 20 minutes late because of construction, it's going to come. 
Mm-hmm. And I and that's how I see auditions. Eventually, they, they're, they're going to come. But as far as like the number of auditions, you know, I went, what was it, last pilot season? I think I've auditioned for so many pilots. Mm. Came up empty handed. This season, I feels like, I don't know, pilot season and us, we've uncoupled. I don't know. <laughs> no, there was only 13 pilots. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. Yeah, and Because so- you told me you auditioned for three or four. And I said, well, Elisa... <laughs> Your math, there were 13. So you auditioned for like a third or fourth of the total available pilots this year. I would argue you had an amazing pilot season if we're talking math and numbers. Okay. Okay. So then the win is I actually got the audition for some pilots this season. I think we spend as actors, and it's true, we spend a lot of time talking about the business, which is understandable. Mm-hmm. But sometimes mm-hmm. we invest too much time about what's not happening and the challenges of this business. Will, and I always tell actors, I'm like, what you're feeling, the obstacles that you feel you're facing, you face it on every single level. Mm-hmm. And I have friends on every single level. Their journey is a little bit different. You know, the degree of the role may be bigger, Mm -hmm. but it's the same thing. Like I would say somewhere, I'm sure, you know, someone, I don't know, someone like Jennifer Lawrence is wondering why, how come Anna Taylor Joy is getting everything right now? Totally. It's it's, it's the same. You're (laughs) so right. I know that for a fact because I have friends at those that level and they're like, so-and-so's taking all my roles now. And I'm like, gosh, there's always somebody coming for you, right? No matter what level you're at. And it is scary because once you've been in the industry long enough, you do remember like those five actors from when you were in high school who were the top, I mean, irreplaceable, face Mm -hmm. everywhere. And then you think about them sometimes, you're like, where? are they and nothing was a better example than this last oscar ceremony right i mean That's brendan right. Fraser, just gone and apparently there's a really good podcast interview that we'll put a link to uh where he said this isn't my great return it wasn't like i went and like took a nap somewhere and then was like you know what i want to come back he said i've been auditioning and trying to work this whole time But the narrative was like, and he's back. And he's like, no, I've been here. You guys just had your own moment, but I've been here, right? And so that is so indicative to me, everyone that won and and had their Mm -hmm. their moment of the highs and lows, the randomness for for many people of the ups and downs and swings of any particular career. And once you're in it long enough and have enough friends also who've had incredible highs and had real lows and have gone through it yourself, don't you feel like it becomes, I don't know, a lot less personal? Like it feels less personal? It does. There's, you know, there's a really great, I love, I don't know, Miguel Ruiz has a book called The Four Agreements. Mm -hmm. And one of them is don't personalize. Mm -hmm. And that's what I always remind myself of is don't personalize Mm -hmm. because it's not personal. Like I look at now, like I remember seeing an interview with Denzel years ago, I think when he had been nominated for one of his many Oscars, it might have been Malcolm X or something. Mm. And they asked him, and somehow the conversation came up about opportunities for black actresses, and black men in the in, in the business. Mm. And I remember him saying, you know, Angela Bassett, who knows? She was nominated for an Oscar. She probably will never get back to the Oscars again. Mm. Mm. And guess where she was this year? Yeah. Yep. back at the Oscars again. Yep. You know what I mean? So it's like, you never know. I always look at opportunities like that. What I love about this entire award season is that most of the winners were all women, at least for me, over 50. Yeah. Wasn't that cool? It was absolutely cool, but but also really inspiring because mm-hmm. I feel like no longer are we at a place where a woman's career kind of ends when she starts, I'll say, looking 40. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You know, no longer is that the norm anymore. It's storytelling. And I think streaming services has contributed to that. So I just, that's why I wanted, when I said, you know, talking about the chatter. Yeah. um, I get actors who say, well, you know, well, they say that da 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 And I always ask, who's they? And what do they say when you ask them that? You know, they're they're like, well, you know, they, my my friends, who, who are your friends? Well, other actors. Okay, so there's that's like saying they say that there's going to be a curfew from now on at ten o'clock in West Hollywood. Well, who's they? Did that come down from 
the mayor's office? Well, my friend said on his block. And it's like, no, 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 no. Right. Stop with the chatter. Mm. Because first of all, everybody's journey is different. You know, or I'm sure you hear way more than I do. Mm. You hear it all the time. They come with these like, they say they heard mm. that you should be off book. You, you need to be completely off book for your self-tape. Not when you gave me 17 pages today and it's due tomorrow. That ain't going to happen. Right. Which, and I was, and I always share with that. I was like, I'd rather be the actress who you believe, even though I'm using mm-hmm. the paper, mm-hmm. than the actress who did a great job at memorization and you believe nothing. Yeah. You know, like even with self-tapes, I'm like, okay, I'll, my choice with self-tapes of like, like I had one that came through yesterday for a commercial. I don't even want to get started on commercial self-tapes. It's like, okay. Here, could you could you be in a car and then jump out and roll on the ground and then jump on the top and be on a horse? It's like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> so anyway, as I have a friend of mine, he pretty much is an amazing commercial actor. That's all he does. And he gets frustrated mm. with what they expect you to do. I said, this is my rule of thumb with mm. self-tapes. Certain things, if, if I'm able to do it and it won't upstage me, it's not going to stress me out, fine. But for the most part, what would you have me do if I came in the room? Mm. Mm-hmm. You would not expect me to do all of this. No, you wouldn't say, can you get on this horse? Yeah. <laughs> right. Can you get on this horse and then jump off and then be in a metal, be in a gold metallic suit? No. So I really treat it as if like, what would you have me do if I came in the room? Mm-hmm. And that's how I can figure out to what degree I'm going to try to make this. Like, I love the self tapes that you post of people who book the job and some people oh. really go there. Yes. And I'm like, God bless your soul. After all of that, you went outside, you hung out in an alley and I don't know, picked up some trash. But don't you love too how that's just like a, that's just like a couple. And then some people are just, are literally just standing, (laughs) talking, no props, no nothing. They're just standing. Mm -hmm. They're doing whatever they're doing. They're just standing there. And that's part of why that is so important for me to keep posting those is because it's like, see, who cares? Whatever. Exactly. It comes down to that actor's choice mm-hmm. and what they believe they needed to do to be to, to live in the world of that character. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. that's how I see it. Everybody mm-hmm. works differently. Like I always tell people, like, there is no right or wrong. It's what works for you. That's what it comes down to. That's one of the things I love about your perspective, your experience, and any of the actors that are fortunate enough to, to know you and get to work with you ever is that you are bringing so much perspective from so many different sides of the table from writers to directors to actors to all of it and your perspective and knowledge is earned and experience it's not just randomized you're not like you know what I feel like saying well and here's the thing too because of social media, Mm -hmm. anyone can become an expert on anything. Oh, shit. Yeah. So, you know, like sometimes I'll go on, you know, I'll see some of these podcasts and it's like, and I'll be like, oh, well, who is this person? They seem really knowledgeable. And then I'll go on IMDb and I was like, okay, so where did this wealth of information come from? Because from what I can see, three shorts doesn't really constitute you being an expert. That's just an opinion. Now, you know, the good thing is it's one thing for you to do this and you bring experts on. Great, Mm -hmm. right? Great. Mm -hmm. But it's a whole nother thing for you to give all this commentary based on your experience of having shot three shorts. Not that I'm not knocking that because that person could give one little nugget of information that could be life changing, you know, for for someone. But I say that when we talk about the chatter, that's also part of the chatter. And it's like, God, I wish we had Audrey Helps actors when I was coming into this. Someone who could put some realizations, really guide me into like, no, you don't have to do that. Blah, 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 blah. All of those things. You know, we didn't have, we didn't have an, no. And RG helps actors. We just had they. Yeah. So, and look, they in backstage. That's what we have. Right. Had. And mostly they were, unfortunately, for many people, and not to knock them as acting trainers, but from my experience, was a lot of acting teachers yeah. who, who weren't and hadn't really worked. Yes. You know, and, and that didn't mean they didn't know how to teach me acting, mm-hmm. but it did mean that they weren't necessarily qualified for the current moment of how to book jobs, how to be a working professional. What is the current moment of what is booking jobs? I mean, I had a friend, oh, Elisa, oh, this one actor told me that he waited all COVID to take this acting class in person, finally goes and takes the first class in person. And he said right away, somebody tested positive for COVID, so they went right back onto virtual. And they were like, don't worry, the virtual class is great. And he said, the entire time, the only thing they did was cold reads. And I said, 
what do you mean they talk cold reads? And the actor was like, yeah. I said, under what circumstance is cold reads at all viable anymore? And they said the teacher had told them, well, if you get, you know, four auditions a week, you can't work on all of those. You're going to have to do some of them cold. And I thought, what? <laughs> like, I don't think that's true, actually. No. Unfortunately, I think the expectation is you better have that stuff pretty well down. You don't have to let go of the page necessarily, but no. it better not be a cold read no. audition. And not that that's fair or not that that's right, but that is the current professional standard as we sit here, you know, March 2023. I felt so angry for everyone who was taking this class and everyone who didn't know better to know that that was absurd and yeah. thought they were getting some valuable skill by learning cold reads when this class <laughs> couldn't change their curriculum that I promise you is from like 1997. Mm -hmm. Back when back when Elisa got her SAG card, that's <laughs> how old this curriculum is. It is time to change it. And the purpose of cold reads, right, was because they literally didn't have scripts to email you. So they had them in the waiting room and you would go in for a room in person. And then they would say, you know what, Elisa, that was so great. You know, can we go have you go outside real quick and for 20 minutes just go work on the role of Janine? That would be awesome. And then just come back in. And so cold reading skills were an important part exactly. of the audition skill set. None of it is applicable no. to today's and you can buy And you can buy time. You can buy time. You can buy time. Like if you honestly don't think you can give your best, there's nothing wrong with reaching out to your agent saying, Listen, I know this is due today by five. Is there any way I can have till tomorrow? Like when I was, mm -hmm. I was, you know, I was in New York for the past year and a half, mm -hmm. and I ended up being in the hospital for a health issue. And I yeah. thought I was going to come home like that Monday. And I got an audition, and I was like, "Can I get some time?" So they gave me till like after the weekend. I was like, "Okay, I come home on Monday." Mm -hmm. I worked on it with an acting coach. I wasn't prepared. It's a mess. The, the, the yeah. acting, he was great. He was like, "You know, at least I'm not going to even take your money." Like he was like. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I want you to just revisit this tomorrow. Call yeah. your people, see if you can get an extension so you can really work on it. And he was 100% right. Yeah. Next day I was ready. It was on and popping, right? But yeah. even then, I still called my agents back again and said, can I have more time? Mm -hmm. Reached out to Cass. And they were like, oh, yeah, tell her to get it to us whenever she can. Now, it might have been Cass, but whatever. But I look at every audition as a cultivation of a relationship, mm -hmm. not the role. That's how I have to see it. If you're constantly going in for the same, no one's going to keep bringing in a bad actor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No one has that kind of time to waste. So if you keep going in for the same casting office and you haven't kept booked anything, that's okay. They okay. like you. Believe me, they're fighting for us too. When I first came to LA, because I was coming from New York from doing theater and mm -hmm. whatever little independent, and I remember I, I had this audition and the casting director said, that was good, but I need you to bring it down by like 10 times because mm. I was doing the theater version theater. of this mm -hmm. character. Mm -hmm. And so, and I remember her referring me to a cold reading class mm. and it was perfect. It helped me, blah, 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 blah. But, but more importantly, it helped me how to use the camera. Mm. Mm -hmm. She gave us a technique on memorization. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like you just showed up and then you do the, because for that, you can get with some, some friends and do that. Yeah, that's right. Hey guys, yeah. let's get together and let's yeah. just do some cold reading. Some cold reads. <laughs> You can show up at a theater, some of these theater companies who, who where writers need to hear their projects. And it's mm -hmm. like, okay, so we're going to sign, you're going to do so-and-so, you're going to mm -hmm. play Mary and Beth, da 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 da, -da. Mm -hmm. You don't mm -hmm. need to, where we are, not in the climate of which the climate. we have to audition now. And those are the people that often, unfortunately, are also then given career guidance. And that, to me, can lead to a lot of this chatter that leaves actors confused and also because they are desperate to solve what they perceive as a problem, which may not be a problem. It may just be time. It may just be more opportunities. Absolutely. It may just it, it also may be a problem. And that is what's hard. That's what sucks about it. You may have an execution problem. You may have that. And how Absolutely. are you going to get somebody who's going to tell you honestly, and can you trust them? Do they know what they're talking about? Are they qualified? Which is something I wanted to talk to you about with regards to your own experience. You said that 
Michael sometimes coaches you for auditions. And I love you talking about that because you are also one of my favorite coaches, just so everyone knows. Elisa, on top of being an outstanding actress, is a really outstanding coach. And a few years ago, oh, I, I no, truly, your, your, your actors work. They get better. They're so lucky to have you. And I reached out to you several years ago and I, I said, Elisa, I need you to... I need you to start coaching actors. Do you think you could do that? And you were like, oh, okay, sure. Sure, okay. And thank God, because so many of the beautiful spirits that you've taken under your wing, I know, are in such great guidance. And also, their careers have really moved, which is so exciting. And what I love, though, is that you are getting coached also. And I know that Michael is getting coached. Like all of us need somebody who can give us a hand, give us a perspective, sometimes Mm -hmm. pick our attitude up off the floor, help us make it fun or help us calm it down a notch, you know, whatever, whatever it is. So tell me about your experience with regards to your desire to be coached sometimes is it all the time is it some of the time is there a time when you feel like coaching is maybe not necessary whether that's to you or to other actors what what does that look like to you um it it comes down to the stakes of the role like if it's something that i deem as something that could be career changing that's really big right Mm -hmm. and i feel like i just need to make sure i have created the correct roadmap Mm. to get me where I believe this person is supposed to be experiencing this journey. Because mm. that's how I view characters. I view them as like, this is a human being, and I have to put together the pieces of the puzzle of their life mm-hmm. in these four or five pages. Because mm-hmm. whenever I get something, I read it at least three times mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. different viewpoints, right? And so if it's something I'm like, no, no, but this is one of those things where I think if I coach with someone, it can really get me to the next level of where it of where I believe it needs to be and it confirms to me that I'm on the right road. Now, I could also call you and we could do the same thing. Sure. But there's something about having an out for me an outside source who doesn't really know you personally. Mhm. Who mm-hmm. is really who you are paying, mm-hmm. who is there to really make sure who will be really honest with you mm-hmm. because you know the thing about coaching, you can feed actors a bunch of bull crap if you want to, but if they're mm-hmm. not seeing any rewards even in their talent, of the, if they don't see that they're progressing as an actor, because because you know we can't control what happens you book on a job, yeah. But we can get you to a place where at least you know it's not you. Mm-hmm. I really base it on the the stakes of the job, and when I work on it, if I'm on the right, if I'm on the right track. But like one of the ones I worked with, when Michael was on, it was for a lead of a movie. And it was based on the book that I had read and I didn't realize it until I'm like, wow, this, all this sounds really familiar. Hmm. And then bingo, a light bulb went off. I was like, oh, this is that book, blah, 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 Hmm. right? It was 17 pages. Oh my God. But here's the thing. I was like, okay, it's five scenes. It's 17 pages. I know for a fact there's an offer out for this. Like Mm -hmm. I know, because I knew one of my friends who works all the time, who they wanted to have a meeting with her for a Mm -hmm. supporting role. So mm. I was like, I know. So I was like, but here's what I will do. I will show them what a good, how good of an actor I am. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's how I looked at it. So, so that was like, let me get coaching on this. And I'm glad I did because it's something about when you don't have any real stakes in a scene yes. that you can really see it much clearer than the person who does. Yes. I always tell that to people all the time of like, when you're in it, so much of it is like acting. Yeah. I'm doing acting now. This is acting. (laughs) But then when it's not you, the same scene, you're like, oh, I see. This character is about this because this goes to this and this goes over here. And what they really need from the role is something like this. Great. And you would be great for it because of this. Right. And it's like, Mm -hmm. oh, it just falls into place so easily when I'm not like in panic, like auditions. Well, you know, the other thing, too, that and we know you go we go through these programs and we go to school and we do all this stuff. Everyone prepares you, mostly prepare you for the idea that everyone's going to be successful, Mm, that that you're going to graduate, you'll be Mm -hmm. on set, you'll have an agent, you'll be in set, that everything is just going to line up exactly as it's supposed to, simply because you've gone through this program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you get through that program and it was like, well, I'm not in SAG, I have no credits, 
I got to I'm broke. Uh huh. So, but you know, so because if you because I've been, you know, we've all been in those classes where everyone, mm-hmm. everyone's preparing you for the success of the business and mm-hmm. not the actual journey. And that journey could take three years, mm-hmm. six months, or it could take six years or fifteen yeah. years, thirty, or it can happen in two years. And like Brandon Frazier, then mm-hmm. there's a lull. Mm-hmm. But did he stop working? No, you just hadn't seen what he what he was mm-hmm. doing. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't like he left the business and became I don't know a manager at Ralph's, <laughs> no. he just, you know what I mean? He just continued. Right. He no continued. shade to Ralph's managers. No shade. Nothing. Nothing. To, listen, Ralph's, he just didn't do it. You know what I mean? Right. It's not like he left the business and went on to a whole new career. Right. You, you know what I mean? He yes. didn't do that. He continued, he continued the journey. And yes. I think for us as actors, you're right. Whether it's an acting class, a program, it's like everyone kind of, most people, programs, teachers, whatever, prepare you based on your success in this business. Mm-hmm. And success is very different for everyone because mm-hmm. I believe, you know, as a journeyman actor, which I see myself as, is that actor who's like consistently worked, is able to take care of themselves. You know, they buy houses, they put their kids mm-hmm. through college. You mm-hmm. don't know their names. You mm-hmm. may know their faces or you may say, oh yeah, I remember you such and such. But guess what? They're doing very well. They're doing very well. But wait, Elisa, you phenomenally talented, thoughtful, kind, badass you. Wait, I have to interrupt you. Help me. I need some help. And now it's time for Listener Questions. I'm so scared here. This listener question is brought to you by Carla Zuniga Hair. That's Carla Zuniga Hair. She cuts my hair. She cuts Jesse's hair. She does a lot of a lot of haircuts for a lot of incredible people that I know. She does curls. She is a curl wizard. She's usually booked up for months here in LA, but she has a couple of slots left in June. So snatch them up by DMing her on Instagram at Carla Zuniga Hair. That's Carla Zuniga Hair for magical, fantastic hair. Now is the time. This listener question is also brought to you by Greg Saffel at singinglessonslosangeles.com. Explore your voice to explore your casting. It's our body and voice. That's what we got here, everyone. Our body and voice. Improve the strength and diction slash articulation. Fix vocal fry. Eliminate nasality. Releasing tension from the voice. Accent reduction. Add singing to your abilities. He loves working with total beginners as well as highly experienced singers. It's a safe space. Greg is super great. Super affordable. I highly recommend him. Also, if you are one of those, if you're like a, if you're like a bro and you hold your breath up in your chest because you're like, I'm so tough. And then you're hearing from your acting coach that your breath isn't dropping down. uh, That's something that I think you should go get looked at. And if you are one of the people who has not ever worked your voice, but you work out and are in yoga class and you're working out and hiking and doing all the things all the time, I say, nay, you will go work on your voice. Go to singinglessonslosangeles.com. All right, call us with your strike stories or questions at 667-ACTOR-70. That's 667-ACTOR-70. Hi, Audrey. This is Jessie from L.A. I'm wondering, when you are put on a veil or pinned, do they let you know if or when you've been released? I have a show that I was put on a veil for for a week and a half from now and just got offered another gig at the same time. And I didn't know, like, do you ask? Or do you just assume you didn't get it? At what point do you know if you've been released? Thank you. Bye. Hey, Jesse. Love your name. Also, congratulations on all this incredible momentum. That's just fantastic. You're booking it. All right. So long story short, usually they don't tell you. Sometimes they do. It's great when they do. But usually they're too busy, so they don't. If you are getting an avail check or a pin or a hold or a watch and advise or information that you've booked another role, definitely just call and have your agent or manager, your representation, just reach out to the other person and let them know. That way they're like, well, we really want her still. 
uh, maybe they can bid for you and the highest pay gets it. But usually rep will just contact the original person and just let them know. And usually then they're like, oh yeah, we forgot to tell you. Yeah, no, that role was already cast. Sorry, our, our bad bye. But always good news. And to call and let them know that you've booked something else and you're no longer available is good practice. And also lets them know that like, you know, they missed out. You're so awesome. You booked something else. So there. And you know, that's just, that's just neato. So congratulations. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. There's like famous in like a national or international level. And then there's, there's the famous that like most agents slash working actors slash people in casting slash producers, they, if you're like, what about so-and-so, they know who that is. Exactly. Like their mom doesn't know who that is, but they know who that is. And exactly. that is a really wonderful place to be in because you can go wherever you want to eat. Probably most people aren't going to recognize you. And also you can pay your bills and get a house. Exactly. Go on vacation. Mostly qualify for health insurance. Well, you know, the other thing too is that, you know, I have to, uh, the other thing I always share is that acting is really hard. Yeah. Yeah. Being an actor is really hard. And people think, people look at the glamour of it. Like I said, everyone doesn't have that journey. And, and when I say hard, it's really emotionally challenging mm -hmm. because it is the one profession that you cannot escape. Mm. I can walk out of here right now and be like, I'm not going to think about acting today. I'm going to go hiking and I'm going to go have some coffee. And then as I get in my car and cut through Laurel Canyon, God damn it, there's that billboard for that job I didn't get. Reminder, trigger. Okay, then I get to Fryman, and I hike and I'm going to go and have my coffee. And I'm like, oh, fucking great. There's the billboard for that commercial I didn't get. You know what I mean? So no, the thing is, no matter where you go, you will, even if you decide, I'm just going to come home and I'm just going to binge watch a show. And then it's like, wow, why, did, why wasn't I seen for that role? Yeah. yeah. Oh, damn. It, so you can't escape it. So what you emotionally, I have to say, where's other jobs? My sister works at a bank. When she leaves the bank. She doesn't have to worry about it. She's not going to get triggered by B of A because she works with PNC. She just lives her life. It's so good. What I love about that perspective, you're, you're dropping some real beautiful truth bombs here because it reminds me of when people talk about what's hard about dieting or what's hard about being broke is that you're inundated with it all mm -hmm. the time. So, you know, why dieting is really challenging compared to other things that maybe you're trying to get control over is like, you've got to eat. Absolutely. You have to eat. So then it's just about what are you going to eat? How are you going to eat it? When are you going to eat it? You can't just go, no, food. Right. I say nay to you, right? And so it it's this tricky little bastard in your life all the time. And one of the things they say about why being broke is full of so much shame and so depressing mm -hmm. is because you are, again, inundated with money. People are always talking to you about buy stuff, buy stuff. Do you have money? Can you buy stuff? Can you go out to eat and buy stuff? Can you, so-and-so's birthday's happening. So-and-so's getting married. Do you pay this bills? Like it is a constant barrage of, of pay me, pay me, pay me, pay me, pay me, pay me, pay me. And it leads people to feel very cyclically shamed and, and less than. I love the mirroring of that same sentiment as part of the effect of the acting career because I, you know, I always tell people with the Super Bowl, it's like going to a party with all of the guys that dumped you because it's all the commercials I auditioned for and didn't get. And just like ad after ad, I'm like, oh, look, there's that AT&T spot. I'm so happy for them. They're doing so well. It's so great. Yeah. But, but that's the thing. It doesn't. And so I say, so then it's like, so the next thing is, how do you manage that? Yeah. How are you able to manage that? Yeah. And how you manage it is that you do your best to release any connection to it when you're not doing it. How do you do that? Well, one of the things that I do is I find other things that interest me. Mm. Like literally, I'll be in here. I love interior design. I love fashion. I love all that stuff. I can literally just have my TV on YouTube all day watching episode after episode of Open House New York and Architectural Digest. Because now, once again, does it trigger also the mm. finance? It's like, yes. man, would I love to have a penthouse like that in New York? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But what I find 
it's the reverse because for me, it's like, man, when I get that, da 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 And I'm not saying a $50 million penthouse, but what I am mm-hmm. saying is that when, what I can do with the space. Mm-hmm. And so I say finding other interests and also to limiting the amount of time you are on social media. I tell like actors that I work with, like I have a couple actors who have come in and they're like, I just want to have actor friends. I say, no, you don't. <laughs> you don't. And here's the thing. And what I, what I mean is that you don't want to actively seek out actor friends. Yeah, they'll be there. They'll be there. You Because what you're, what you're seeking out is not a friend. You're mm-hmm. seeking out an actor who you want to be your friend. And that's mm-hmm. what that relationship is going to be. It's going to be an actor friend relationship as opposed to you want to have a good circle of friends who can be supportive of you. Yes. You can be as supportive of them. Yes. You're comfortable with each other. Um, they make, they, they understand you, you understand them. And if they happen to be actors, that's one thing. Like one of my best friends who I met when I, we met in acting class when I first came here and she never acted. I don't know what she was in the class at that point. She thought she wanted to be an actor. We were in class together and she was like, Hey, you want to be seen partners? I was like, yeah, let's be seen partners. We have been friends ever since. She's one of my dearest friends, never acted, not once, but we became, we met in an acting class. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? As opposed to me taking an acting class, wanting to make actor friends. What mm-hmm. you want is someone who's a friend to you, who can support you at your lowest, at your highest, who understand and who will tell you the truth. Yes. Because that's, that's the other thing is mm-hmm. you want someone who can put a mirror in your face mm-hmm. and you are comfortable looking at what they see, apologizing sometimes, mm-hmm. crying sometimes, and you can do the same to them. Mm-hmm. That's what you want. Yes, you don't absolutely. need like that actor friend who's like, hey, did you go in for such and such? Mm, I know that's hard. Well, here's the thing. You're going to have them anyway. You don't have to seek exactly. those friends out. You don't have to seek them out. They're there. Well, here's the other thing that's kind of changed that too, RG, because a lot of those friendships come out of auditions. Mm-hmm. You end up running into the same actors at your Absolutely. auditions Absolutely. and you start talking. It's like, hey, girl, let's have coffee. But yeah. now everything self takes. So the opportunity for that to happen mm-hmm. doesn't happen as much. But I will say, mm-hmm. you know, just to say to manage the chatter yeah. is yeah. limit who you follow on social media, mm-hmm. um, limit mm-hmm. your time on social media. Honestly, I don't care to be a really close friend of yours. And if they're constantly posting because they're working and they excited, that's great. If it triggers you, mute them. Yeah, I know. I have booted people. And I will tell you all honestly, there are people that I didn't feel I could root for. And I had to be honest with myself about it. Yeah. And I had to stop following them because every post of how great it was all going just made me hate myself. And I didn't think that was fair to either of us. Like, they didn't deserve that. I didn't need that experience. And I'm I'm talking like two people. I won't shout them out. But I'm talking two people in my life that I was like, yeah, I can't. This isn't. Let's not. And I did. I felt better. I'm going to tell everyone. I didn't unfriend them, but I, I did hide them. Well, because the thing is, here's the thing. We're, we're in a business, you know, like I tell actors, you, you know what your job is? Your job is to display human emotion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what we do. We portray human emotion, right? Mm-hmm. And sometimes mm-hmm. it's happy. Sometimes it's sad. Sometimes it's crazy. Sometimes it's, you know, mm-hmm. envy or whatever those things are. Mm-hmm. But that's what we do. So we live in a world of having to utilize our emotion. So yeah. what does that make us? It can make us somewhat emotional people, depending on yes. who you are, which yeah. is like I say, every actor at some point in time should go to therapy. Mm-hmm. Please do it. Please. So, so I say that to say that because of that, mm-hmm. we tend to be sensitive. We can get triggered easy. And it is something that people want so badly that it's sometimes it can be challenging to root for the people you love the most. It can be hard to root for that friend who you're really close to because you are so close to them. The great thing in self realization Mm -hmm. is and work on yourself is when you know that's what's working for you. It has nothing to do with them. Mm -hmm. This is, this is your stuff you've got to work out. Mm -hmm. And so what I do is I look at these people as expanders. I look at them as like, if I'm feeling any degree of envy towards someone, an Mm -hmm. actor, I look at it as like, because that's a reflection of, they have something that I too want. Yes, that's right. And you and I have talked about that before, and I always yeah. love that perspective. You know what it does? It calms it all down. It's like a reflection that takes the heat off of it, which 
when I'm in that spot, that's exactly what I need. I need like, let's turn the heat down, Audrey. Like, yeah, and use it as inspiration because I have mm-hmm. a few actors friends of mine now who like have on these wonderful shows and everything. Mm-hmm. And I look at them and I'm like, they deserve it. They have been doing this stuff for mm-hmm. so longer than me for so long and constantly just getting to the edge. Just and finally mm-hmm. they got it. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, they. It's so deserving. It's like yeah. it is so deserving. She deserves. They deserve every opportunity they're mm-hmm. getting right now. Mm-hmm. They really mm-hmm. do. For me, it's like, okay, listen, do we, we all want shows, right? We, at the end of the day, we sure. all just want to be working. Right. But the thing is, there's working, but then, you know, there's a saying, be careful what you wish for, because you just mm-hmm. might get it. Because we also know people who are very successful who aren't as, as happy as you would They're think they would be. Definitely not as happy. No. And, and they weren't really before either. And it exactly. didn't change anything, right? It, it just no. added more pressure and more money, which added more pressure. You are who you are. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you are who you are. If you like, yeah, I remember hearing an old interview with Roseanne when she first did her show and it was like, how does it feel to have money or whatever? She was like, listen, if you were an asshole before now, you're just going from a poor asshole to a rich asshole. And that's very true. It just magnifies yeah. what was already, what was already there. Yeah. yeah. But I, but like I said, I do think one of the things that helps with the chatter is you know, limiting what you see on, you know, Insta life mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Twitterverse and all of these places. Yeah. And really put that energy into your craft. Mm-hmm. Or, or, or seek out better influences, right? Absolutely. Like if you're going to be looking at stuff, look at stuff that makes you feel better and inspired and excited. And as opposed to stuff that makes you feel bitter and jaded and frustrated and like you're losing out. And if that's what you're feeling, then yeah, change what's on your screen. If you're going to be on your screen, change what you're looking at. Yeah. Um, Okay. I always wrap with some questions and these are specific to this section right now. I'm adding some because of where we are in the industry right now, if you will bear with me. So this season is all about the space between the jobs. Have you ever had a year where you didn't book an acting job of any kind, commercial, theatrical, theater, anything like that? Yes. Yes. I could put an S on that. Years. Years. Yes. That's what I wondered. Yeah. Because that's, yeah. that's, I mean, Michael talks about his years and I talk about mm-hmm. mine and, and that that's really, that's common. I just want everyone to know it's coming for you. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. just think of whoever you think of that is the person that has not had that. And I would bet a lot of money, no matter who you're talking about, that if we opened up their books and looked at who didn't work, who has a year or two, I think Everybody in this industry has had a year or two here and there or more where Mm -hmm. they didn't work. Have you had a year or years where you did not qualify for your health insurance? Yeah. That same year, I did not qualify for my health insurance and I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I just can't. I mean, we'll have to have you on to do a whole other thing about that because <laughs> it's like it is like your whole story about that. I'm like, ah, ah. Um, yeah. she's she's OK, everyone. She, she's yeah, I'm fine a now. Sur- survivor and a thriver. OK. Have you had a year where you've made over 100 grand as an actor? Yeah. Yeah. I'll say this. Barely over. Great. We'll take barely. I'll take it. OK. How do you feel about the practice of taping yourself regularly to stay in shape, especially for actors who are maybe a little newer, a little greener, or actors who've had maybe like a a dry spell? I think given the state of affairs, because Mm -hmm. the numbers are so high, Mm -hmm. any opportunity that you can practice that, you should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I always, I encourage my actors to do self-tape May, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because even if it's not self-tape May, just practice. I encourage them to work on more than one take when they're doing their self-tapes. Yep. You only get better at stuff the more that you do it. Mm-hmm. And also the more that you do it just logistically, you can get it done quicker because now Absolutely. you know exactly what lighting you need. The mm-hmm. other thing that I push for people is that start treating yourself tapes as like you would in the room, especially with your slates. Mm-hmm. So when you do your slate, you're like, hi, I'm Elisa Perry. I'm 5'5". Five, five. I'm based out of LA, blah, blah, blah. Say hi, just like you would in the room. Mm-hmm. Hi, Vicky. Haven't seen you in a long time. It's Elisa here. Hope mm-hmm. your dog's well. You know, personalize your slate. I love that. I love that. I always tell people, if you want to be working at Elisa's level of four auditions a week, have you tried one audition a week? Because you're not going to get to four a week without overwhelming yourself and having a major catastrophic anxiety attack if you aren't used to volume. 
So if yeah. volume is something you would like to operate on, then not only does the volume help you with the acting, but I believe the volume also helps me with the attitude. Because if I'm used to practicing two to four a week, whether or not I have the auditions, then when I have two to four a week, my attitude is in a better place because I don't feel inconvenienced by the fact mm -hmm. that I'm doing these auditions this week when I'm like, oh, they're not going to watch it anyway, or they've got an offer out of it. I'm like, I would be doing an audition right now anyway. It might as well be one for an appointment I actually got. And remember, that audition isn't just for that job. It is a That's cultivation right. of a it's relationship. A relationship over time, which I have to say, you have a particularly profound understanding of that because you have enough relationships and you have enough experience in this industry that you have seen, my guess is time and time again, that it's just relationships over time plus excellent work equals a career. Yeah, listen, I, it's, yeah, I had an audition for a movie years ago mm. that ended up winning a bunch of Oscars. And I, so a actress friend of mine who was the lead in it referred me to it. I just knew. Mm. Didn't get it because the movie Steven Spielberg's company was doing it and it was a new director. It was like all mm. this. And the director had fought for his friend to be in it. And he came mm. back and was like, I can't fight for your friend. Like, it's like, good. Luck, but I will, we, but believe me, I'm not going away. Because of that audition, mm. the, that casting office that I went in for, I've been in several times since then. But on top of that, the head of casting for his company has literally gotten me three jobs and two were offers. One was an opportunity to actually work with Steven Spielberg. So the same man who was like, no, nah, not her, cut to a few years later, guess what? I get to work with him. So, you know, you just, all I can say, we just have to keep going. And, and think like for everyone, think years. Don't think like, I'm going to build this relationship and then in two months, I'm going to book this other job. I want you to think, I'm going to build this relationship seven years from now, it, because that's it. It may, be, it may be two months, but it's likely seven years. And great, because that's how relationships in this industry work. Okay, but wait, Elisa, you phenomenally talented, thoughtful, kind, badass you. Wait, I have to interrupt you. Help me. I need some help. And now it's time for Listener Questions. I'm so scared here. This listener question is brought to you by Castability. Are you tired of sending your self-tapes into the ether never to get any response? Well, get some feedback. Mm, yummy, delicious feedback from a casting professional. For just $25, you can submit a tape every single weekday to their casting directors. They've got free original sides for you, including some Lord of the Rings style sides. Find out your strengths and weaknesses with their feedback in believability, specificity, creativity, personality, and finally, someone's gonna win the role. They're gonna judge castability Somebody's going to be like, I would choose this person. And then they post it, and that's sort of happy. Visit castability.actor slash self-tape May 23 for free sides every day in May and for your special self-tape May $25 offer. And now that it's the end of May, check out their other offerings and use promo code Audrey10. That's promo code Audrey10. All right, call us with your strike stories or questions at 667-ACTOR-70. That's 667-ACTOR-70. All right, so this listener question actually came in via text, so I'm not going to play it for you, but I'm going to tell you what it said. It was a question about retouching headshots. How much is too much? If you have particular scarring or blemishes, things like that, what is the line or the rule regarding retouching? So here's here's the thing about your headshots. It kind of depends on how familiar people are with you. Uh, headshots are like the first calling card to say whether or not you're right for what casting is envisioning for the role. Now, at a certain level, everyone knows who you are. And so headshots become far less important. Like I have two headshots on my profile. They're not really even headshots. They're like publicity type photos, but that's because people know me already and my resume is speaking for itself. My reel is speaking for itself. I'm going out for larger size roles where really my footage and my relationships are the things that are getting me in the door. So for some people though, their headshots are the like key to getting them into the audition, getting them that self-tape request. 
The thing is, when there was a lot of controversy about whether or not casting directors did, could, should, or would watch all of your tapes when you submitted a self-tape, one of the interesting points about it was the fact that actors so often don't look like their current headshots or real, that they don't look like their current materials. And so part of why somebody might start to watch your footage or start to watch your tape and then stop it is because visually speaking, you are not fitting what is being looked at or looked for for the role. And that I'm told is because you don't look like your materials, including your headshot. So when it comes to retouching, first of all, I say don't look like a doll. Stop it. Second of all, if your audition tape and your photo look like two completely different people, then you're probably not helping out casting. So one of the best examples I have of that is maybe somebody who has completely shaved their hair off. So they have a different look. And maybe before they had like this long, curly Barbie doll bleach blonde hair. Well, you've now changed, you've now changed your look. So in terms of retouching, there are certain things about your face that might give it the character that you have. For me, I always make sure that they include my freckles. I have a very freckly face. I'm full of freckles, like a big old freckle face. And a lot of times, people who retouch my photos would take all of my freckles out, I guess because maybe people don't like their freckles. And I would have to say to them, listen, do not strip my beautiful photos of their beautiful freckles. These freckles are booking gold. You shall leave me the freckles. I have other friends that when they did their photos, they made sure to leave all the lines in their neck, like all the wrinkles and lines in their neck, because it added to the character. And that's part of what's hard about photos is that they're these flat images and they can be very altered. And once you start moving your face around, what does it do? That's part of why they used to do screen tests before we did tapes, is they used to do screen tests because in a singular photo or somebody seeing you in person, that's often two very different images in and of itself. But then how you film on camera is another thing. So what you want to do is try to make sure that not only are the photos looking like you, but looking like what you look like on camera when you tape. Also, sometimes it's like, does it just look like the category? And then can you go in and do great work? But in terms of retouching, look like your photos. If you get rid of your lines, if you get rid of your freckles, if you get rid of a mole, if you get rid of those things, just know that then when you tape, they might be getting a different product than they think that they were going to receive. So if you are getting a lot of feedback, such as you're not getting further in an audition, if you're getting like 40 auditions, or you're not going further in any of them, one reason might be because your execution is lacking. Another very plausible reason is because you don't look like your materials. And so they think that they're gonna get a sample of an apple slice and instead you're giving them a sample of an orange slice. There's nothing wrong with the orange slice. They just needed to cast an apple slice and you're giving them an orange slice. So look like an orange slice. I hope that's helpful. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. Do you have any social media that you would like for people to know about? Well, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. <laughs> I'm on Instagram at lovey Lisa Perry, L U V, at lovey Lisa Perry. I'm on those. And I'm going to spell your name E Lisa. E as in E equals MC squared, everyone. E Lisa Perry, P E R R Y. So L U V E Lisa Perry. It's also in our show notes, everybody. You can check out our show notes. Uh, okay. Do you, and you don't have to, do you have any questions for me? Yes. What keeps you going? Because you are like, the biggest inspiration and cheerleader. How do you keep going? 
Thank you for that. I keep going because I truly am so inspired and excited by people like you who I think are such treasures and gems and both in front of and behind the camera, both in life and in and in the craft and in the industry. And I take a deep sense of satisfaction and pride in feeling like I am amongst a group of such generous and valuable creators and creatives. And I take a great sense of satisfaction in in the cheerleading and in the remaining passionate because I think it helps us all uh, stay engaged and stay passionate. Just keep the work valuable, honestly, and, and keep yeah. ourselves in the work because the rest isn't really in our control. And I find it just to be really rewarding to support each other in the harder times and also cheerlead each other in the win times. And especially when people have been it long enough that neither one feels particularly personal, but can all be cared for and cared about. I love that. Do you have, because I, because Arja, you know, it's interesting because you don't talk a lot about it if, on your podcast. It's like, hmm. what an amazing actress that you are both comedically and dramatically. And I've seen you kick an ass with some of the bats, like looking at, you know, I really have them sitting there with you with Jessica Lang to ah, uh-huh. um, Dope Sick. Like, I'm mm-hmm. like, and but then I can see you on like, I don't like a modern family and you'll have me cracking up. Mm-hmm. And so what advice I will say, would you give to that actor who believes that they can only fit into one category? I would say, is that belief serving you? Because if somebody says that they only fit into one category, but they only want to fit into one category, then I'm sort of like, go live your best one category life. Like, that's fine. But if they believe they only fit into one category and they would like to fit into more categories, I would say that's the best. Honestly, that is the best time to explore and experiment kind of like playing in a sandbox. Just just think of like whatever you're scared of or stiff in or whatever it is. You might surprise yourself, and that's really some of the most fun of acting is when you're like, aha, I I did it, right? But find a low-stakes environment to mess around and go mess around. That's why I always tell people, too, with with self-tape may is, you know, a, a really great objective is to have something that you feel like no one will let you do. Like, if I did all self-tapes from Lord of the Rings... No one has cast Audrey in sci-fi fantasy fiction. It's just not happened yet. And that's fine. My days are coming. It's going to be great. But if I felt insecure about that, then I would love to just do a bunch of tapes as a bunch of elves. I would just have the best time being an elf with a sword. That sounds exciting. And there's something about the low stakes play of it to me that then I think can open up what is my idea about that thing versus my experience of that thing. And then do I, be- do I believe myself in it? And mm-hmm. anyone who knows anything about any genre knows there is a place for everyone in every genre. I meet people all the time who are grumpy, serious, grumpy gooses, and they think they can't do comedy. And I'm like, The best people in comedy are so grumpy. I would tell me about it. Very dark. So dark. And also just like so curmudgeon-y. Just like dour. And it's so funny to watch everyone have this like life and enthusiasm. And then somebody comes in with a kill line that gets all the laughs because they are just so grumpy. So yeah, I would say, I would say that. What is the best part about the business for you? Working. (laughs) <laughs> I love no, okay. that you said that. No, listen, no, don't even change it because that's I'm not so funny. Because nobody has said that and it's so real. And it's my favorite answer yet. Everything we do in the business is to be working. So I'm not going to sit here and say, what's the best part about the business? You oh, me. doing my self tapes. No, if no, I never had we're... to do another self tape again, I'd be fine with it as long as I was working. Okay, what is the worst? <laughs> What is the worst part about the business for you? 
The worst part about the business for me probably is not working, <laughs> but I probably will say our egos. Our egos, yeah. It's horrible. Yeah. I hate I hate the egos coming at me. Listen, I got into an argument back years ago. I was doing literally background work on all my children. And this was Gosh. when we there were no cell phones. We're all in yeah. one room. And this one actor that was on the show, he was so rude. We all had that one phone to use. And one of the actors was, I think I needed to, he was rude to me. And I remember it was like, excuse me. I was, he and I got into it. I was like, fire me. I can, this $35 you give me for the day, I'm good. <laughs> but you will not disrespect me. I'm not going to be, dis- so I have to say ego. Ego. Do you have any moments or thoughts, uh, memories, experiences about the 2007 strike experience? I do. And okay. one is that um, Showtime still owes me money from it. Oh, um, God. Oh, God. <laughs> could you please pay me? Um, Showtime, the- <laughs> it's been 15 years. <laughs> they owe me. And if you add the interest to that, I want my uh, money. Yeah. Uh, no, my biggest memory was that, um, yeah, I will say because I had done an episode of Dexter at that time. Mm. And mm. because it went on so long, remember they were airing some of the HBO Showtime shows on the networks that own them, like ABC, CBS. So my episode was aired on CBS and I never got any residuals from it. I called SAG and they were like, Mm. yeah, we're having a problem with that season, you think? So that's one memory (laughs) that they stole money from my episode of Dexter. Um, That. And the other thing, too, of how it really fed reality TV. Um, But I will, but personally, personally, I will say at that point, I had a full time job that I was going to. So I just invested in doing what I was doing then, and I supported the strike. Mm -hmm. I am always in support of whoever's going to strike. Mm -hmm. Um, There's more power in numbers, but those are my, that's my, yeah. I just remember it went on for, it went on long. Forever. Yes. Okay. What does success look like to you now as you sit here, 2023, March? Success to me now looks like more creative power. Mm. Honestly, I'm gonna be honest with you. More creative power. I, I also write. I like writing. Mm. Um, but the great thing about writing is that I don't have huge expectations from it, other than I just want to be able to tell a good story. Mm-hmm. You know, you mean it allows me to escape while I'm creating this world. But I also, it inspires me in that success for me looks like having creative power, meaning. Am I going to go in and like try to change it, have the power? Well, I don't like this. I want to change this. No. But in, from the perspective of being able to tell my stories. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And of course, there's the financial aspect of it, of being able yes. to Which travel nice. and <laughs> spend time. A little bougie life. It sounds good. <laughs> Doing okay. great things for my family, you know, mm-hmm. starting a foundation, a college fund, a, mm-hmm. a foundation for all my nieces and nephews to go to school. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, I love that. I would last like to end on, this is mildly interesting, and I'm going to give a mildly interesting about Elisa Perry's life because one thing I think is so important with the concept of the space between the jobs is I know people who just before the pandemic were like, I was just starting to get my momentum going and then the pandemic hit. And I remember my narrative was in 2007 was like, I was just starting to get all my momentum going and booking all these jobs. And then the writer strike happened and the economy collapsed. And I think about these last several years of all the things that happened in life. And, and you have, as you said, you are a breast cancer survivor you have had many ups and downs, both in your control and out of your control, not including, and that's just your personal stuff, not including the writer strikes and economic collapses and COVIDs. And I just want to acknowledge that that is like the normal life and career. You will have outside forces that mm-hmm. will shut your opportunities down. And you will have personal forces that will shut your ability to pursue opportunities down. And yet a career is stood upon all of that over time and still showing up with great humility and equal passion over time and doing the work. And so I really, uh, my mildly interesting is you and your journey and just the willingness that you have had to 
continue to show up for the work and be passionate and share your story to so many and so many instances of all of the ups and downs and that the work continues through all of that. Thank you. I, I, you know, the thing is, Argy, we both, we're actors, we're artists, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we enjoy what we're doing, no matter the ups and downs. That's what keeps mm-hmm. you going. I, you know, and, and I love your honesty with actor, with people who go into this mm-hmm. with blindfolds or whatever. Yeah. If you decide you don't want to do this anymore, that's okay. Great. And there's all nothing three. wrong with that. No. Nothing at all. It's no. just that this is what this person thought they wanted to do now until you realize what it this is. is a journey. Yeah, that's right. And and also that makes me think of um, I told Jesse my my secret hope for not so secret, you guys, I'm letting it out on the podcast for this strike is that everyone left in my category quits that like everyone who's held on through the pandemic is like, I just can't do this shit anymore. And then they're like, is Audrey still available? Is Audrey still active? They're like Audrey's here. Well, just call Audrey. There's literally no one left. Well, I, I'm like, this is like, you know, my category is a little different because we're all like me and all my friends at every level are just playing mm. mamas. So it's I, like, OK, whose mama are you now? Well, yeah, I'm, right. my, now my son is in jail. Oh, OK. Oh. Well, now my son is a lawyer. It's yes. like literally it's like, oh, it's a book club scene. Oh, with all the mothers of all the leads from the show. Oh, so she comes. She's the friend of me to the other mom. So it's right. all, so my thing is like, maybe they'll write more mama roles. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe it will be about the moms now. Yeah. Let's make the shows about the moms. Okay. Uh, do you have anything mildly interesting? This can be something you've read, learned, listened to, want people to know about anything. Actually, yes. There's a great. really, really great, I don't know if you've ever watched it. His show was mm. on DirecTV when they were doing programming. Um, mm. Off camera with Sam Jones. I think it's still, a, he still has his podcast. I don't I know if he's so. doing new episodes, but it's great mm. because it's a master class in the journey of being an actor when he interviews actors. And what you learn from that is that everyone kind of has a similar journey. Mm -hmm. Like you'll listen to Javier Bardem talk about almost losing his life being beat up in Italy when he was on a show because some guys were jealous. They broke his nose. He's like, my career's over. This is it. He never got his nose fixed, got a job here. And as director, what was it about him? He was like, it was your nose. Like how a tragedy turned into this. Like, so I never got it fixed. They couldn't fix it. It was just, that's what it was. Oh, but it's gosh. but it's a really great podcast. It's mm-hmm. so inspiring, great. and you learn so much from it. But what you most of all you learn, I guess, what we all are on, we all have this. There's no overnight successes. Yeah, that's right. And certainly, you might get success randomly, but you won't hold on to success randomly. No, like a career is consistently earned over time. No one stays at the again. top. Mm-mm. I had an acting teacher years ago who said to us. He said. Let me tell you something. The same 20 actors work over and over again. Mm, mm. He's kind of right. When you look at the movies that come out, it's just oh, like, yeah. they're just moving pieces. It's just moving. Yeah. But no yeah. one, but it doesn't stay the same 20 actors. No, it's not the same 20. It's the same 20 for those two years. <laughs> and they shuffle those 20 out and put a new 20 in. Uh-huh. The recycled 20. You Let me tell you something. This time next month, ask people who won, the, who won each category in the Oscars. I, know, I so guarantee right. you not one person can name just for actors, yeah. you won't find one person who can actually name everybody who won in every category. That happened last year. I was like, what are, oh, t- was that last year that they won? <laughs> I was like, this Oscars, I was like, was that, God, that feels like it was years ago. But no, no, that was last year's Oscars. That was, <laughs> they but won. last year's was overshadowed. I mean, last year's had a whole that's other a moment. That's different. That, that was, that's overshadowed. People only remember one thing. I don't but, know. but for the most part, if I said to you, because I, you know, you know, if you ask people like, well, who won the Oscar yeah. in 2017 for Best Actress? I don't know. Nobody. Not only do not people not know, they don't care. Yeah. Right. So that's why I say you just have to lead with what, as an artist, and just doing good work and enjoying what you're doing mm-hmm. without mm-hmm. the fanfare the that noise. you think may. Yeah, without the noise, mm-hmm. without the chatter. Mm-hmm. The people chatter. chatting in your ear, you know. Mm-hmm. It's the one profession mm-hmm. that when you go home to family, everybody wants an update. I know. If I work at the post office... <laughs> No one's like, how'd it go today at the post office? Any interesting yeah. zip codes come through? <laughs> no, you go home. Hey, when are you going to be on the such and such a show? I don't know him. 
<laughs> you and you and Michael both have career fascinations with the post office. He's like, nobody takes a job at the post office. Like, what are all these letters here? And you're like, I could work at the post office and no one's going to be like, any interesting zip codes come in today? Listen, not only that, and no one brags about their job better than Athens. It's like, yeah, right. just booked this such and such a job. Hashtag blessed. My sister gets promoted all the time at her job. She's in the post on Facebook. Just got a promotion at PNC. Commercial blog coordinator. Blessed. Hashtag blessed. <laughs> like only, only we, which is fine. I get, you know, people think the more marketing you do, the more jobs sure, you sure, get. Sure, but I'll sure. look at, I, I know people, I know actresses who work all the time yeah, yeah. and has for like 30, 40 years. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I'm the only one who's been to award shows. Yes. You know I mean? Right. Yeah, I know. Right. You know I, know. I know. We feel like award show survivors at this point. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> we went to the Emmys and we were both standing there thinking, is someone so over there in a ball gown buying a hot dog? You I can't that? even believe it. It was a, it was a wake up call. That's for sure. Uh, okay, listen, I love you. Thank you I so you much too, for Audrey. coming Thank you on. so much. Next week on Audrey Helps Actors, we've got Jane Marie. Ah, I'm sucking down. Listen, next week is going to be crazy. If you haven't listened to the podcast, The Dream, listen, please do me a favor. Do this. You're going to love it. You're going to binge the shit out of this podcast. It's called The Dream. You can get it anywhere. It's called The Dream. Season one is what you want to start with. You can do season one and season two. It's a great binge. She's coming on. We sought her out. We have an amazing chat. It's a crazy episode. So listen to season one and two, if you want to, of The Dream. Jane Marie. We're also going to choose a self tape winner. Yeah! Thanks so much to Elisa. Elisa, you are just so amazing. This episode was mixed and mastered by Thomas Hank Snodgrass. Produced by Jesse Lumen, my husband. Still so handsome. He gets older and gets better looking. Fuck that guy. This episode was edited by Michael Morello. That's Michael Morello. Show music by Ari De Niro. Theme song by Alok Meta and 108 Hill. And shout out to Matthew Patrick Davis as the mother of the review baby. All right, everyone. I want you to know you're striking. Also, don't forget your towel.